this week with an old friend. I have not spent time with him in a long time, but I went back this week and spent some time with an old friend that I want to introduce or reintroduce to you this morning. That friend's name is Joel, and he has words for us. He's called a minor prophet, but that simply means because his sermon was short and not as long as Isaiah or Jeremiah's, but certainly is pertinent to our day. And so if you would, take your Bible and find the Old Testament little bitty book of Joel. And I'll even let you use your table of contents to find it. It's tucked right in there between Hosea and Amos. If you have a a pew Bible, uh, it's on page 760. And again, let me encourage you, if you didn't bring your Bible, there is a Bible in the pew, a pew rack in front of you. And if you'll open that Bible, you'll find page 760. And there you will find Joel chapter 1 and verse 1. And again, the, uh, the title, as you can see on the screen, is America, What's, what's Next? I want us to pray before we start, and would you pray for me and ask the Lord to, to allow me to deliver the message He's laid on my heart in a way that would honor Him, and then would you pray for yourself that you'll hear this message and receive it and apply it to your life. So let me let you pray silently for me and yourself, and then I'll voice a prayer for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for just the opportunity to gather today and share your word. Thank you for a nation where I'm free to do that. Thank you, Father, for just the opportunity to to say to you today in a prayer, God bless America. Uh, I, I pray, Father, that your word today from this Old Testament prophet that is so timely to where we are as a nation, that you'll allow us, Father, to hear your voice speak through, through his words to us individually and to us collectively at this time, this crossroad in the history of our nation. Father, thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. There were indeed, as Rick has mentioned, there were indeed two rulings this past Wednesday from the Supreme Court. Let me give you a verse of Scripture in response to last Wednesday's Supreme Court ruling. It's John 11, 35, the shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. Christians believe marriage is defined by God and recognized by government. But more and more in our society, many believe today that marriage is defined by government and must be recognized by all. Let me try to sort things out. Let me try to explain to you exactly what was done on Wednesday. The Defense of Marriage Act, otherwise known as DOMA, D-O-M-A, the Defense of Marriage Act is a federal law that restricts federal marriage benefits and required interstate marriage recognition to only opposite sex marriages. The law passed both houses of Congress by large majorities and was signed into law by President Bill Clinton on September the 21st, 1996. Section 3 of DOMA codifies the non-recognition of same-sex marriages for all federal purposes. 
including insurance benefits for government employees, Social Security survivor benefits, immigration, and the filing of joint tax returns. In a 5-4 decision, the court struck down the section of DOMA regarding federal benefits which can be given only to opposite-sex couples. The court ruled that federal benefits must be given to same-sex couples in any state where that state officially recognizes their marriages. Twelve states currently do. To deny them these benefits would deprive them of equal protection under the Fifth Amendment. That was the reasoning of the court. Marriage is a state issue and the federal government cannot overrule who a state says is or is not married. The ruling does limit the federal benefits only to same-sex couples in states where same-sex marriage is already legal and does not apply to same-sex couples living in states where their union is not legally recognized as a marriage, such as Texas. Also, the ruling does not require states to recognize the redefinition of marriage by other states. In other words, Texas does not have to recognize same-sex couples who have been legally married in a state where you can be. Now, the second ruling Wednesday was Proposition 8 out of California, and it is a little more complicated, and believe me, I'll stand corrected by anybody that knows more than I do about this. I, I do not even pretend to know it all. Proposition 8 was a California ballot proposition and a state constitutional amendment which passed in November of 2008. Only marriage between a man and a woman is valid or recognized in California. It passed a ballot and became an amendment to the Constitution in the state of California. On appeal, though, the amendment was found to be unconstitutional and overturned, leaving the state government of California with the duty of defending the constitutionality of the amendment which their people had passed. The only problem was the state government officials refused to defend Proposition 8. Governor Jerry Brown believes in same-sex marriage and therefore ordered his attorney general not to defend Proposition 8 as it had been overturned by the appeal court. So, a group of private citizens took up the appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court ruled on Wednesday was that a private party does not have standing to defend the constitutionality of a state statute. The state must do that. And they have refused to do so. A private party, a private group, cannot defend the constitutionality of a state decision. So they don't have legal standing to be there. That was the court's argument. So the decision goes back to the appeal court, which overturned the amendment passed by the California voters. And unless the state of California takes up the appeal, highly unlikely, as I said, because the governor, Jerry Brown, believes in same-sex marriage, the appeal court's decision that the amendment is unconstitutional will stand. And in about 90 days, same-sex marriage will become legal in California, making it the 13th state plus Washington, D.C. to permit same-sex marriage. Now, needless to say, our society, our culture is changing on this issue. When you read that Bill Clinton passed DOMA in September of 1976, both houses of Congress by wide majorities, and he signed that bill, you see that the position on same-sex marriages has changed quickly in this nation. Quickly and dramatically. In fact, one recent survey says that 64% of Americans believe that the legalization of same-sex marriage across the board in the United States is inevitable. 64%. Count me as one of those 64%. 
Despite evangelical Christian belief and the belief of many other faiths that homosexual activity is personally sinful, society is deciding that same-sex marriage is permissible and should be legal. So how does the church respond? How do we as believers respond? What should Christians do? Well, we're not much different than the people in Joel's day. They looked out across the landscape of their country and saw something that they had never seen before. They looked out across the landscape of their country and they saw something they thought they would never see. Look at Joel chapter 1 in verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Now, here's the first good word of the morning, church. Joel means, the name Joel means Yahweh is on his throne. Amen. Jehovah is God. That is what Joel means. Verse 2, hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? In other words, can you believe such a thing like this has happened in our day? That is what Joel said to the people. Can you believe such a thing like this has happened in our country? And I want to say the same thing. Can you believe? That we are actually debating the point of whether two men and two women can be married. Can you believe such a thing has happened in our day? Verse 3, tell it to your children. Let your children tell their grandchildren and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Move down to verse 10. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up. The fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple and all the trees of the field are dried up and gladness dries up. From the children of man. Now, the people of Joel's day looked out at their land and they, had, they saw that their land had been destroyed by locusts. Physical destruction. That destruction in verse 4 concerns a horde of locusts that came across the land and destroyed the crops. It destroyed, as you can see in verse 10, it destroyed the, the vine and the olive and it destroyed the palm and the apple and the pomegranate. And all of their fields were destroyed. And life as they knew it had changed. What should be there was gone. What always has been there was no more. And here in America in 2013, we look out across the landscape of our society and it's not a physical destruction that we see, it is a moral destruction that we see. The locus of immorality, the locus of a godless worldview, the locus of man-centered thinking have destroyed this culture. What should be there is gone. What has always been is no more. What do we do? How do we respond? You and I know that the courts don't determine our morality. You and I know that they don't decide what's right and wrong. And so regardless of what government does, we will just keep on doing what Jesus calls us to do. Wednesday's Supreme Court rulings did not change the plan of salvation one bit. We have the same mission that we had last Sunday. We are to love people, serve the hurting, 
feed the poor, care for the elderly and dying, and bring Jesus to people, sharing the good news with them, and then building them into mature Christ followers. Our response to the current moral trend is not to panic, it is not to worry, it is not to be afraid, the sky is not falling, but neither do we do nothing. Listen, light still shines, salt still savors, truth still matters, prayer still Works, love still overcomes, and Jesus still saves. We will cling to the cross, stand on the rock, and remain steadfast in the truth that mankind's only hope is found in Jesus Christ. But we got to be honest. We must realize. That believing what the Bible says about sexuality will increasingly put us at odds with this culture. At least I hope it will. This should go without saying, but I, but I feel like I need to say it. Any sexual activity outside the boundary of a man-woman marriage is sinful. And Christian church, we need to hear that. It's, it's not just gay sex, it's any sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage. Any is condemned in Scripture. And it is that belief that increasingly puts us at odds with this culture ravaged by the locust of immorality. And in the days ahead, particularly as homosexual activity finds increasing acceptance in our society, pressure will mount to adopt a worldview rooted in the culture rather than in biblical revelation. And we must prepare ourselves for the day when acceptance by believers will not be enough. We must prepare ourselves for the day when acceptance of gay marriage will not be enough. But when affirmation will be demanded for us to be a part of of society. And that day is sooner than we think in light of Wednesday's Supreme Court rulings. What about a Christian school? What about a Christian hospital or a social service agency or a retirement home or child care facility or a food pantry? Will they be required by law to recognize same-sex marriages? Catholic charities in Massachusetts after a century of operating an adoption agency that matched children with parents, ceased to offer the adoption service rather than be forced by the state of Massachusetts to place children with same-sex couples, which is obviously contrary to Catholic teaching. Catholic charities in the state of Massachusetts said we will shut down rather than comply with the law that says we have to place children in same-sex couple homes. We'll shut it down. What are we going to do when the state authorities mandate that K through 12th grade education standards include and teach this new understanding of marriage? And what constitutes a family? If religious universities offer housing to married student couples, will it be charged with discrimination if it denies that housing to same-sex married couples? Just some of scenarios that you and I need to consider, dear family, for the day is coming when they will be on our doorstep. 
So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we do what the people of Joel did. Turn over to chapter 2 in Joel's letter to us. Words to us. Find chapter 2 and verse 12. By the way, the introduction to the sermon is now over and I can begin with my point. Joel chapter 2, let me read verse 12 through 17. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. Who knows whether He will not... Turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion and consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest... The ministers of the Lord weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Now hear me. Sometimes God allows the locusts to come to chasten His people. Sometimes God even sends the locusts to chasten His people. And they leave the land desolate, judgment becomes a reality, and God's people respond by returning and crying out to Him. And here's an even deeper reality. Those people who try to oppose God, those people who rebel and resist and shake their fist at His moral law, those people who fight for their so-called rights, those people who oppose God only serve to further His purposes. God sometimes allows even sends the conditions that we now see in our land to turn us back to Him. To cause us to return and cry out to Him. So here's the point that I want to make this morning. Here's our life point this morning. America, what's next? Next for America must be an awakened sense of dependence upon God. Next for America must be an awakened sense of dependence upon God. In this Independence Day week, let us renew our commitment to be dependent upon our God. Look at these verses. Verse 12 begins by going, yet even now... In the midst of this cultural slide towards Sodom that we are in, yet yet even now when court rulings and popular opinion run contrary to God's Word, yet even now return to me, declares the Lord. Return with fasting and with weeping and mourning and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return, for, for I am gracious and merciful and slow to anger and, a, and abounding in steadfast love. It is a call to pray. It's a call to come with a repentant heart. To come and pray. To come with a repentant heart to a gracious and merciful God and implore fervently for this God to give us grace and show us mercy. It's a call to Turn to God in true repentance and total reliance. And what is key, what is the secret, what is vital is it's not just an outward show of repentance that our God wants. It's not just the kneeling and the fasting and the, and the mourning. Those are all good. But what's important is that your heart must also be behind those expressions. That's what it means when the verse says in verse 13, Rend your hearts, not your garments. I'm not interested in you ripping your heart, your, your, your garment because you're, you're in mourning. I'm interested in you changing your heart. And so, the heart condition is the most important thing to God. And so you and I this morning... What God would call us to do is to remove anything in our life that hinders our relationship with God. 
Individually this morning, we need to remove anything in our life that is halting our spiritual growth. You and I this morning individually need to remove anything that stands between us and our God. And we need to repent of it now. That's His word for us today. That's the task all of us have this morning. Then we are ready to move to verse 15. Verse 15 is a collective call. After the individual repentance that takes place in verses 12 and 13 and 14, verse 15 calls for a solemn assembly. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. It is a collective crying out to God. All of us, young and, and old, even the newlyweds are to be in attendance. They're not excused from this. And our main business collectively is different than our main business individually. Our main business collectively is to implore the God of grace to reverse the moral slide, to not allow His name to be a reproach in the culture, to show Himself Lord and King so that the society around us will not ask, where is their God? Where is the God of these believers? We must ask of our God, spare your people, O Lord. Raise us up. Let us be salt. Let us be light in this generation. Let us speak the truth in love. Let us share the message that Jesus saved. Would that God's church, would that God's people throughout this land and nation were aroused to pray like that. What might occur? What might the outcome be? What's next for America must be an awakened sense of dependence on God. Look at verse 25 of Joel chapter 2, and I'm headed to my seat, I promise. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent. There it is, which I sent among you. Verse 25 tells us that God can restore the years the locusts have eaten because He sent them in the first place. Dear family, I'm here to say to you this morning that God can restore this nation once again to the place where we truly are, one nation under God. He can do it. He can do it. I've told you before, I've lived long enough now to have a little perspective on things. I was thinking this week, we, we're, we really are at a crossroads in this country. 30 to 35 years ago, we railed against Madeline Murray O'Hare and Hugh Hefner, the atheist and the playboys. They didn't necessarily hate us, but we hated them with a passion. For their lies and the immorality they spread across our land. We hated them. And we railed against them. And over these years, they have returned the favor. They have marginalized our faith as being out of touch and culturally unacceptable. Now here we stand again at a similar crossroads. And we can either get furious at them again and perpetuate the cycle, or we can respond like Jesus. Our mission demands the latter. After all, you can't hate a people and reach a people at the same time. If we're going to reach this generation, even those in this generation who believe in same-sex marriage, if we're going to reach this generation, we must learn to love them. All of them. Not just the ones who look like us, not just the ones who dress like us, not just the ones who believe like us, all of them. We must learn to love them and speak the truth 
and share Jesus as the only hope for mankind. So don't rant on Facebook and rage to your co-worker or your neighbor. You pray. You cry out to God. And even though the culture has changed, our mission has not. We still exist to bring Jesus to people. We print it in the worship guide, the bulletin every Sunday. We still exist to bring Jesus to people and then build them into mature Christ followers and no court ruling will ever change that. Next for America must be an awakened sense of dependence upon God. Would you bow your head with me?